You probably recognize a football stadium from above. We've all seen aerial views of football games on the news, for example. But would you recognize your house from above? Would you recognize the influence of pesticide on your yard from above? And would you recognize deforestation? These are the kinds of questions that we use remotely sensed imagery to understand. I'm Dr. Kelly Cruz Meyer. I'm on faculty in the Department of Geography at University of Texas, where I teach courses in remote sensing and GIS, or Geographic Information Systems. In those courses and in my research, what we do is take information from airplanes and satellites and use that information to understand how people are impacting the environment. Technically, remote sensing is any information that we observe about an object when we're not physically in contact with it. So, weather stations, even thermometers in your backyard. But when we say we use remote sensing to understand the environment, we mean we take information from sensors that are flown either aboard aircraft or on the satellites orbiting overhead. Traditionally, remotely sensed imagery really meant black and white air photos. And then with military advancements, we moved to having infrared photos, where now we could see more than we could just see with our eyes. We could start to see things in the near-infrared portion of the spectrum, so longer wavelengths. Over time, our technology has developed to be able to sense in the thermal portion of the electromagnetic spectrum as well. So things that we feel with our skin as heat, we can actually see in thermal imagery. Sometimes we examine color to try and figure out what's going on on the landscape or in the ocean. So for example, sometimes it's not safe to eat shellfish when there's been an algal bloom, what we call a brown tide or a red tide. We can actually see those different colors in the ocean compared to what we would normally associate with how the ocean should look. But sometimes we use pattern to understand what's going on in the landscape as well. So it's not just colors, it's how the patterns change over time. Some of these patterns we can detect with our eyes, but some we have to detect via the numbers, and that's why we have a lot of computer processing involved with remote sensing. So there are two main things that we measure in remote sensing are the type that I do. First, we use GPS in order to go out in the field and find very, very precise examples of the things we hope we've identified correctly in the remote sensing analysis. This is referred to as accuracy assessment, and it lets us discover things that we may have missed or misunderstood and also tells us how much of the time we're correct and how much faith we can put in our overall findings and analysis and what that bottom line really means. Secondly, what we then try and do is after we get everything tied to a particular place on the ground, we look at how it changes over time. And that's one of the reasons that satellite information is so important. So this is a high-end GPS unit, but in many ways it's very similar to the kind that you could buy in a hunting and fishing catalog or at an REI store. The difference is instead of this one costing $200, it costs around $13,000. And instead of being able to detect something within, say, 30 or 50 meters or worse, we can get to within less than a meter, sometimes even less than a centimeter of accuracy on the ground in terms of location, which is very important for analysis to make sure you know exactly where you are. This part is where you enter your data. You can enter information like where you are. You can also read on the screen the coordinates that are being received by the satellite. This egg thing floating above my head is what houses the antenna. So when you use a GPS, one of the things you're doing is communicating with a set of satellites about 24 to 28 that orbit the Earth. They're part of the Department of Defense system and it's available for anybody to use with the unit you might have at home or in your car. Ideally what we hope to do when we go to the field is be able to see the landscape in a similar situation as we did in the satellite imagery and we can go in and see how much of an area has actually been cleared, what's going on at the local level, and then understand how to link what we find in the field to the patterns that we see in the imagery. The hard part is when we're trying to verify patterns or things we find in imagery that's 20 years old because there's no way to go back in time. So what we do then is try and talk to people who have lived in the area a long time, find other sources of remotely sensed imagery like old air photos, 
that you might find in many government offices or even just old maps and photographs of the area that people have. So a job like this means that you spend nine months of the year in front of the computer doing analysis on the computer and hopefully three months of the year in the field taking these kinds of measurements. The great thing about satellite imagery and even air photos as well is that they let us see a large area at once. And so we can take that information we gather in the field about particular people and particular places, even particular plants, and then zoom out and see what the implications of that local information are for regional trends. The first area I worked in was in northeast Thailand and we were tracking both deforestation and agricultural change over time where a lot of forests were cleared to plant rice and some other cash crops. From there we moved to a similar project but focused a bit more on the migration of people in response to changing environmental conditions in the Ecuadorian Amazon. And we now have a newer project going on in the Peruvian Amazon where we're trying to understand how people impact the environment differently when they have different environmental amenities available to them. So you live in an area with good soils, you may make very different decisions about what to do with your land, how long you want to stay, and even how big a family you'll decide to have based upon that. One of the things that we're finding in a lot of the analysis, not just in the work I do, but in the field generally on many different continents, is that we're seeing, I think, a threshold change, not only in the rates of certain processes, whether it's deforestation or climate change, but we're seeing a change in the types of process. It really looks as if we may be working into a different era, environmentally speaking. What's hard to understand about that is our understanding of time as humans is very different. We think about 50 years of change or 100 years of change. And so it's very important when we have analyses like remote sensing to try and link them to records like ice cores and pollen analysis to understand what the Earth was like 10,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago. Because if we don't understand those cycles, we can't understand where we've been and where we're going accurately. You're not filming that, right? Because you don't, you don't get to put that at the end. <laughs>